Πώς εκεί πέρα. Já, maður gerir það bara. Já. Halló. Nei. Það er þessi hérna. Já, jú. Nei. Nei, nei. Er hann hérna... Ég nota hann bara. Er hann kannski kvartar eitthvað þessu? Þetta er, 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 þet
office has been uh, taking part in, in recent years. Uh, the two most recent one uh, is uh, climate and energy system, which was, a, which was a joint Nordic project and had an Icelandic sister project called the Loftus Breitingar or Aurifera Orkukervi or Samgöngur, which would translate into climate change and their effect on energy systems and transportation. Uh, and the results that I'm presenting here are mainly from these two projects. Uh, and now a new uh, joint Nordic project uh, uh, has been in initiated, which is mainly focusing on the physical processes uh, that are ongoing while the glaciers are being wasted down. And that is called stability and variation of Arctic land tests. Uh, but to the study area, then we are here located in Agurere, uh, and we are looking at the fate of Langjökull and Hofsjökull, which are our second and third largest glacier, with metrological data from Kveravellir, and we will see the runoff for Öster Jökulsá. Uh, and the predicted uh, changes in temperature for Kveravellir can be seen on this graph. Uh, we have the historical uh, variation, and then we have 13 different climate scenarios. Uh, they vary a bit in uh, the amount of predicted warming, uh, but they are all indicating a substantial uh, increase. Uh, and we should also note that there is a, a considerable variability, both between the scenarios and within the each scenario. So we are still facing the natural variability that has been in the climate. And this warming will cause the glaciers to melt. Uh, here we are seeing uh, Hofsjökull and Langjökull, and in the corner we see the ca time counting. And they are losing volume uh, um, as, the centuries goes, as this century goes by. And this work is done by combining mass balance model models with ice dynamics. Uh, and this is mainly done by Guðfinna Aðalgeirsdóttir and Thomas Jóhannesson. And uh, which, uh, the figure uh, that I was showing was just one of the 13 different scenarios. But here we have uh, combined all the scenarios onto graphs. Uh, the one that I showed is the black line here. Um, and here is the precipitation increase uh, predicted for the scenarios. It depends a bit on the scenario, uh, but is uh, maybe around 16 to 20% for Kveravellir. Uh, and these uh, changes, they will cause the glaciers to shrink and diminish in volume. Uh, Langjökull, which is located on quite low elevated bedrock, uh, uh, has a problem, so it will be uh, lose substantial amount of its mass, while Hofsjökull, which is located on top of a volcanic caldera, is a bit better off and has still a substantial volume uh, at the end of the century. Uh, we should note that the climate, as it was between 2000 and 2010, uh, if we keep that as a constant into the future, the glacier will lose volume. So they are not in balance with the current climate. It is too warm for them. Uh, we should also note this one scenario here, uh, which is both relatively cold and also wet. And uh, increase in winter precipitation can partly compensate the effect of increased summer melting. Uh, but as we are uh, melting the glaciers, uh, away, uh, we are releasing this water that is stored in the glacier, and this will cause substantial runoff increase in the rivers. Uh, so the runoff will increase and peak maybe around the center of the, uh, the, center of the century, uh, but then as the volume and area of the glacier will diminish, uh, the runoff will also diminish as we reach further into the future. To look better at this run of changes, we will do some. Uh, we did some hydrological modeling, uh, and we used a, a distributed hydrological model from Swiss called Vasim, and it is designed for alpine catchment, so it takes good account for snow and glaciers. Uh, but we uh, input weather and information about terrain and geology into the model and uh, calculate the behavior of the discharge in the rivers of the glacier and of the snowpack. So we take the uh, needed input information, we uh, put them into grids on a one cross one kilometer scale that we input to the hydrological model, uh, then we compare the, what we model to measurements in the river, and we calibrate the model until we have a calibrated hydrological model that we can then use to calculate runoff, for example, for changed climate in the future. And the results from these calculations uh, for Öster Jökulsá can be seen on this graph, uh, where we have uh, the situation in our reference period, which is 1961 to 1990, 
compared to the result from the scenario, which is showed with the gray spread over here. And we can note that the glacier peak is increased uh, in the coming decades. Uh, so we are looking at uh, the scenario period for 2021 to 2050, so quite close in time. Uh, yeah, we have higher uh, glacier runoff during the late summer. Uh, the spring melt is diminished for most of the scenarios, um, and winter discharge is highly increased. Uh, the average temperature difference between the reference period and the scenario period for this area is around 2 degrees Celsius, and there is a precipitation increase of about 16%. Uh, but this is, of, all of course, different between different scenarios. And uh, the red line that we have drawn here is the situation as it was in 2001 to 2009. And we can note that there has already been a considerable change uh, in the direction of future changes because of the recent warming. And the effect of the runoff, uh, our combined effect of uh, changes in snow melt and changes in glacier runoff. So the snow melt is uh, diminished uh, during springtime, so the spring flood is lower, but that is because we have increased snow melt during winter time, leaving a thinner snowpack to be melted in the spring flood. And uh, for the decades 2021 to 2050, the glacier has still a substantial volume, so the glacial runoff is high. Uh, so the glacial peak, uh, the late summer glacial peak, is both increased in magnitude but also in duration. And if you conclude these results, uh, then runoff from the glaciers will increase substantially due to increased ice melting during the coming decades. The duration of the glacial melt period is predicted to increase by nearly two months, so it will be reaching further into both spring and the autumn. Uh, and the glacial melt peak will become larger in volume and magnitude and will be a more dominant feature in the discharge. Uh, so for many rivers, the glacial melt peak will be the main feature of the seasonality instead of the spring melt that is uh, the current main feature. Uh, but we should note that this increase is, however, only temporary, and the glacier runoff will decrease with decreased glacier volume in the last quarter of this century. Uh, there has been a misunderstanding uh, in the Icelandic society that glacial rivers will stop to flow. Uh, the precipitation that is precipitated on the bedrock that is underlying the glaciers today will, of course, uh, be discharged into the river, so we will still have water flowing in the rivers, but they will no more be glacial rivers, but direct fed rivers or groundwater fed rivers with completely different seasonality compared to the glacial rivers. But there can, however, be some changes in water divides uh, and uh, in river courses uh, because of changed glacial geometry and extent. And this can have important consequences, as for example for Skeiðará, which is in the southern part of Iceland. Uh, this was one of our main glacial rivers, sometimes uh, discharging a huge glacial outburst flood, like here in 1996. But today, the river has moved to the river course, that is, to the west of it, uh, leaving uh, the bridge over Skeiðará, uh, the longest bridge in Iceland, crossing more or less uh, only dry riverbed. And yeah, these changes may, be, uh, may affect uh, both the hydropower industry, transportation, tourism, and many other sectors of the society. And we are already uh, seeing what we can expect in the future, because compared to the period 1961 to 1990, a warming of about one degree has already been observed during the last decades and causing considerable distance changes in the same directions as the predicted future changes. Uh, and this means that the glacier and river runoff are already considerably affected by human-induced climate change. Uh, but we must bear in mind that glacier changes and runoff variation in the next few decades uh, will nevertheless be much affected by natural climate variability as they have been in the past. And the predictability of all these uh, results is, of course, also limited by the scenario-related uncertainties. And, yeah, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, for, Berger, for this excellent presentation, uh, short and clear. Thank you for sticking to the time limit. Uh, we will have the opportunity for questions and, and, and dialogue uh, at the end of this session, uh, after the coffee break, but uh, 
uh, before we, the coffee break, we have uh, another presentation. Uh, Sigmar uh, Arnarsson, who is a, a master's student at the Norwegian College of Fisheries Science in Tromsø, Norway. Uh, he will be speaking on what some see as another beneficial uh, impact of uh, climate change, uh, which is the mackerel coming to our waters. Uh, and his, the title of his talk is uh, Northern Shift of Species, Effects of Mackerel Processing in Iceland, Social, Economic and Adaptability Analysis of the Municipality of Vopnafjörður at the East Coast of Iceland. Sigmar. Yeah, well, you learn uh, in this field that you need to have uh, long, interesting titles, I guess, in your presentations. <laughs> so I'm try trying to do that as well. Okay, yeah, uh, my name is Sigmar Arnason. I'm a master student at the University of Tromsø, Norwegian College of Fisheries Science. Uh, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, our newest immigrant in Iceland, uh, the mackerel. A little bit about the mackerel, highly micro migratory fast serving pelagic species, has a high, high market value and tends to ignore EECs. And here you can see the distribution, uh, it goes uh, way north, northwest, and even this is an old picture, uh, and the distribution it goes even more northwest into uh, green, Greenlandic waters, for example. So in Iceland, uh, the mackerel started as a bycatch, but uh, the catch increased significantly over the years, uh, reaching a top in uh, 2011 with uh, close to 160,000 tons. But uh, there has been no agreement about the division of the quota uh, among uh, mackerel fishing states, and the dispute is currently at a stalemate, and I'm not going to go into that. Here you can see the catches, how they have developed over the years. Uh, bycatch with uh, Icelandic herring fisheries in the spring, uh, and then it rose significantly, and uh, later on they started to issue unilateral quota. The catch in 2013 is estimated to be 100 and I think 13,000 tons, at least that they issued the quota around that. Uh, the effect, significant gains for Icelandic economy, second most valuable export species after cod in 2011, uh, accounted for 9.6% of total fisheries export, which is quite significant, and it has had positive effect on municipalities. And the municipality of Vopnafjörður, which I'm uh, talking about, is a case of a municipality that has, has benefited from the fisheries. Uh, the municipality of Vopnafjörður is in the northeast, this place over there, uh, not far away from Akureyri, but quite isolated though uh, from other uh, towns. Akureyri is, is in fact uh, one of the main uh, service towns that they, they, they go to, uh, the local people, to, for shopping and, and, and other, other stuff. You can see it's not a big place. Uh, it has uh, the, uh, they have a new harbor, uh, or new ways, uh, they uh, had to invest a lot to, to establish their fisheries sector there. They had the problems before, but they have now upgrading the facilities, which is uh, quite positive and had the positive effect for the uh, future investment in, in the municipality. It's small, like I said, uh, only with 670 inhabitants in 2012. And if you only talk uh, about the town, then they have 527 people. Large decrease uh, over the decade, uh, decrease over uh, around 20, 20%. And the main reason uh, is that young people leave and don't come back. It's a similar pattern than uh, other rural or coastal community society, societies have followed. And here you can see how the development is. Uh, but as you can see from uh, 2008, eight, nine, uh, starts to level off a little bit. And uh, already in 2013, there was an increase by 13 persons, if I remember correctly. The population pyramid in 2012, we can see, is not, uh, not a beautiful one. Uh, missing uh, 
year classes, gaps of people missing, people that should have young children, uh, people at uh, childbearing age, etc., and the population is getting older. In uh, 1998, it looks more uh, uh, normal, basically. It's like a pyramid, but uh, yeah, as you can see, the change is uh, significant. Well, if a little bit about the background of Hopnefjörður, the settlement was threatened due to weak status of the processing company that was there. The municipality took a high risk in securing the settlement by investing in the processing company. Uh, later, they uh, merged into the company of HP Grandi, uh, with the promise of in increased investment and activity. And uh, HP Grandi is one of the largest uh, fisheries companies in Iceland. And Vopnifjörður is heavily dependent on fisheries and fisheries processing. And after the merger into HP Grandi, there has been a huge investment in the pelagic sector, both in fish mill production and uh, in, uh, in, in processing for human consumption. And as you can see, the factory is a big part of the municipality and is, is actually in the center of the town. Everything is uh, around uh, the factory, so people live uh, close quarters to it. A little bit of history. Uh, 2004, merger with HB Grandi. 2006, mackerel caught by bike cuts around Iceland. And in 2007, they start uh, processing uh, mackerel in Vopnifjörður, but only for fish meal in the beginning. Uh, in 2008, uh, the company officials, they make decisions to make uh, intensive investment in the fish mill production, and a year later, uh, same decision for the pelagic processing for uh, human consumption. And already in 2009, they made some experiments with uh, processing uh, mackerel. And in 2010, they uh, started for real, and in 2011, all mackerel that was landed in Wapnifjörr was processed for human consumption, except for cut-offs, etc., that was not uh, suitable for human consumption. Investment in the municipality by the company has as high as 31 million euros, which is a lot in such a small community. And there of direct uh, investment in uh, mackerel, for mackerel processing is 6 million euros. Also uh, a significant uh, uh, investment in such a small place. And this has uh, shown there's uh, increased harbor activity. This, this for example, was uh, a not usual site uh, some years ago, that you have uh, three ships at the same time uh, landing at the place. But this is a bit a false picture because one of the boats had uh, some problems with the, with the engine and that's why all of them three are there, but I used the opportunity to take the picture. But still, still looks good. And here you can see the landings and the value. It, it's, uh, Going from 2007 as uh, 1,738 tons up to 16,458 tons in 2011. And the value, of course, increased significantly as well. Both, yeah, as you can see, it's a, it's a, it's a huge activity, increased activity within the, within the community. So what does it do? It creates jobs, of course. 17.5% of the workforce in Wapnifjörr work at the HP Grandi Processing Company. 82 jobs at the yearly base. This number goes up to 26% of the workforce, workforce if related jobs are also accounted, meaning contractors and others that work uh, mainly by servicing the uh, processing company. It's, it's a huge 26% of the whole community. But during mackerel season, the need for workforce even increases. You need around 160 people. And then the community needs to, or the, the company and the municipality need to rely on outside seasonal workers. In fact, and that's kind of bad for the municipality because they lose income tax from that. But still, still, it's a positive economic effect. And here you can see how, what kind of uh, economic effect this has had on the uh, municipality. Income tax increases uh, and harbor fees increase as well. So this is very positive for the community. And you know, you need workers, but even though it's very uh, automatic uh, processing company, you need people working there. And in the macro season, you need more. So I conducted a small survey uh, among the staff uh, when I visited them in January. 
And 55% out of 70 that were working at the time answered the survey about the mackerel processing in Vopnifjörður. And 48 of them said that they experienced positive economic change from mackerel. And the majority, in fact, said they experienced a very positive change. And the wealth is becoming noticeable in the community. But the increasing economic, uh, economic activity has led to less social activity. And people say that uh, the town resembles more of a labor camp during seasonal work, and especially during mackerel season. You have so much people coming there, and they only work. They go to and from work and go to sleep. So this has led to a social innovation has decreased. Nobody wants to uh, create an event knowing that nobody will show up. Economic in innovation has also decreased. People do not need to, to find new ways. Everybody has jobs. There's, there's even competition about people. So you don't need to be resourceful and uh, find new ways to do it. You, you just rely on, uh, on this big company. So the, social, uh, the innovation basically drops down, both socially and economically. And the town kind of splits into two parts. Those that feel strong empathy towards HP Grandi. And those are people that are related to the company, people that work there. Then you have the other group that uh, can criticize the company. And that's people that have little or no relations to the company, or even pe people that had some kind of bad experience. So it kind of splits into two parts. And also there's, you, you can uh, perceive this jealousy towards workers during, because the, the high earnings during the seasons. People notice this. But there is, however, a general positive perception towards the company in the community. And the people appreciate what uh, HP Grundy has done. They almost secured the settlement. They, they, it was a tipping point, more or less, for the community. But there's also very strong demands towards the company. People uh, come to them and almost demand that they, they uh, support social events and, and cultural events. They, are, they kind of have to help them because they are so big. So you have both demands and also people appreciate what's going on. And even some people fear that the power of the company in the community is so much that they are starting to control everything what's going on. But of course, this uh, is a debate you can hear from, you can hear uh, both stories. But still, you hear what's going on. Well, back to the staff survey. Everyone that answered the survey, I state again, everyone that answered the survey said the HP grantee was important or very important for the community. It's an extremely positive feedback from the processing company, which is well, it's unique. But it's uh, people appreciate that they have co come into the municipality and created jobs. And for the future perceptions, people are reassured that the company is there to stay. People do not seem to fear natural changes, such as climate change. And they even see that as a, as a positive thing. They fear more entrepreneurial changes. And the greatest concern is the joining of the EU will have negative impact of, on macro processing in, in the community. So my conclusion is that uh, the municipality showed a great deal of adaptability in securing processing in the municipality. But the municipality is no longer in charge of the processing. They are reliant on outside management which might affect the resilience of the community. They are more vulnerable to changes in the fishery sectors since they do not have this control, especially if they do not manage to diversify their economy. HP Grandi has shown even more adaptability, cap more adaptability capacity, and that's reactive adaptation. They have no plan. They just react, basically. I asked about climate change. Do you, do you think about that? No. If something happens, we just adapt to it, we change. We find opportunities, we just find our way through that. They don't even consider climate change as a threat. So, overall conclusion. Of course, positive economic effects, it creates jobs and increases revenue, which is good for the society. It secures settlement, people have jobs out migration stops, and hopefully young people as well. But other effects that you have less positive social effect. 
but they are in kind of a transition mode, which they hopefully can uh, work their way through and create and diversify their economy later on. So this uh, is my main findings. So I would like to thank you, and uh, I have to show you a final slide uh, with uh, all that uh, helped me during my uh, work. Thank you. We have uh, time for questions and comments uh, before coffee. And uh, um, I find it extremely interesting that we have the, in these uh, two examples, these two presentations, uh, uh, examples of how the, how the uh, we have these winners and losers in terms of climate change impacts. And in both cases, whether it's uh, runoff from the glaciers or mackerel on the run, uh, we have the, the, the positive impacts, it seems, at least in the short run, uh, short term. Um, uh, do we have, do we have questions? Yes, uh, my name is Jon Hedersson here at the University at Akureyri. I wanted to ask uh, uh, about the precipitation. I wanted to ask uh, Berg uh, whether, uh, uh, regarding the precipitation, will it be more as uh, we go longer in, into this century because of climate change, um, you said the 16% uh, regarding the system in Skagafjörður or above Skagafjörður, but uh, in uh, Iceland as a whole, can you uh, tell us a little bit about how it will, uh, will evolve? Also, I wanted to ask you about, the, you said that the time when um, Glaciers were melting, it would increase uh, by two months. Uh, will it be uh, roughly one month, one month in each direction, or will it be more in the autumn or more in the spring? Or? Thank you. Okay, um, so if we start with the uh, duration of glacier melt runoff uh, during summertime, um, it is increasing in both directions. So reaching maybe uh, around one month in further into the autumn and one month further into the spring. So extension into both directions. Um, uh, climate scenario uh, are maybe not my specialty, uh, but uh, yeah, it is uh, not easy to predict uh, what happens in the temperature, but that can be done. Uh, there is um, a much larger uncertainty regarding the precipitation, but there is this general notation that there will be a precipitation increase by few percent. Uh, per degree of warming because of increased evaporation from the uh, oceans and an enhanced water cycle. Uh, and a 16% uh, increase uh, of in precipitation for Kvervallir is relatively high compared to what we have seen for other water sets where the precipitation increase is maybe 3% or 10% or we are lower than that. Uh, so, yeah, maybe, maybe to conclude on the precipitation, uh, uh, there might be a slight increase, uh, and it will keep on increasing with increasing temperature, but uh, that is quite unsure. Um, hi, my name is Ambla Oddsdottir. I'm with the Icelandic Arctic Cooperation Network. Thank you very much, both of you, for an excellent presentation. Um, Simon, I just have a small question for you. Thank you for your presentation. I thought it was very interesting. I wish we could do um, research like this on, on all the marginal communities in Iceland. I think we'd know a little bit more about Icelandic community resilience. Um, I'm particularly interested in, in the factor of conflict um, in resilience. And you mentioned uh, that there was conflict concerning the existence of the com company, if I understood you correctly. 
and its effect on the community and the dependency issue. Is that correct? Well, people are uh, kind of worrying that the community is, uh, no, the company is taking uh, over. Okay. That, that they are basically, they come with demands to the municipality and, and they are becoming that big that they are, uh, in fact, controlling everything. I heard voices of concern about that, even though that both the municipality uh, officials and the uh, company officials, when asked uh, about that, they, they, of course, denied everything. No, 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 we are working closely together and of course we want to help each other. But still, uh, people kind of perceive this big player in the community having power, which is not unusual to see. Um, understandably, I mean, there have been, I hadn't actually posed my question, I'm sorry, <laughs> but thank you. Uh, I was wondering whether there were other factors of conflict that you think might, might pose a serious um, influence in, in the community, and I particularly wondered about the migrant workers. Uh, do you have information about the nationality, sort of the, the proportions of nationalities coming into the communities, and is this a, is this a critical factor in, in sort of conflict? Um, in a source of conflict? Well, the uh, workers, they are, are they, there are no conflicts there, basically, because they, people barely see them. They just, uh, you see them when they walk to work, and you see them when they walk away from work. But uh, the most of the workers are Icelandic, though. Uh, young people uh, are working there, and and uh, people that have relations to Wapnafjordur, they try to, to get it because they have stated that people that can uh, uh, find their own housing, they are put into priority in working there. So usually there's, uh, this is people that have some kind of connection to Wapnafjordur. In many cases, uh, young people that are looking for extra money for uh, during the summer season. But then again, they have a little bit problems when the, uh, the young people they are leaving for school again then they kind of have to get in the uh, like uh, I heard the second class workers which they prefer not to have all the time but they come instead of the uh, of the school kids which are really willing to work uh, uh, a lot but regarding nationalities the, there are more foreign workers working there in the slaughterhouse during the slaughter season, which comes also during the same time in, 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 in the autumn. So that's, that's also an interesting factor that comes in mind. The, the town is full of people, but you barely notice them. Thank you. Stekerimur? Uh, no. Uh, thank you. Thank you, came first. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to ask Berger. Uh, we sometimes hear about that our power plants reservoirs will be filled up with sediment. Now oh, you didn't say anything about the sediment load, how that would change. Do you have any ideas or do you know anything about that or have predicted that? Uh, generally, the glaciers they will recede, uh, so the front will move further backwards, uh, creating proglacial lakes. And a large part of the current uh, glacial sediment will be captured in these proglacial pro lakes, so the sediment load is in fact expected to decrease uh, with time. So, yeah, the sediment load will be lower, and also with uh, a decreased glacier area, we have a, a diminished area of sediment uh, creation because the erosion under glacier is maybe a ten times faster than outside the glacier. So, uh, when the glacier uh, stops flowing on the land, it will uh, slow the erosion um, and leading to lower sediment production. Very good. We have uh, time for one more question or comment. Uh, well, two perhaps. Paul. Thanks. Very interesting. Um, and uh, Sigma, I obviously also was working in a plant in, in Newfoundland, and I would be um, interested in knowing: Have you seen any any conflicts amongst the the um, the plant workers, and if so, how were they resolved? 
No, I think there's barely no conflicts, at least when, not when I was there, and uh, people are not so, uh, how, how to say it, heat blotted here, that, that, that there are some critical conflicts, but of course, you know, people are people and there might be some kind of problem, but there's no major issues, even though that you have so many people working there. The company has strict rules regarding, uh, and they, regarding their stuff and they 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 pay well and instead they want to have their best behavior on the job so there are very strict rules about uh, all these things uh, alcohol, alcohol use or even uh, tobacco use etc it's uh, is is not loud etc so if you come hangover to work it's a uh, it's a ground for 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 getting fired for example so it's very strict Yes, thank you both. Berger, just a quick question to you, if I may. I appreciate the complication of predicting how uh, precipitation and climate change will affect, uh, will be affected by climate change. Um, but still, can you give some kind of idea of how these changes will affect water security in Iceland? Do we have any idea how will it affect the generation of hydropower? Are we looking at water scarcity as some areas? Just like in simple terms, what kind of future are we looking at? Uh, regarding the hydropower, uh, we are looking at quite bright future for the next few decades while we are releasing uh, the amount of stored water that we have uh, now in the glaciers. Uh, and after that, uh, it is not so dark at all. Uh, so instead of glacial uh, fed rivers that are being harvested today, we will have uh, directly fed rivers that have a much more even uh, seasonality. So there will be a lower need for large reservoirs and so on. Uh, so regarding hydropower, yeah, it's quite okay. Uh, I'm maybe not sure whether I can comment on yeah the general water usage, uh, whether there might be any uh, danger for like just drinking water or things like that. But yeah, precipitation will keep on being high, so I, I guess we will have a lot of water uh, into the future. Thank you very much. I think this uh, uh, calls for coffee. Uh, we will start exactly quarter past three, uh, and uh, uh, we will observe punctuality. Punctuality. Thank you very much.